It is my pleasure to introduce two authors who are uh, both Mi'kmaq authors, and we're really pleased to be presenting their stories as part of our Voices campaign of videos, which is a series of videos where we're trying to highlight voices that historically have been not heard or even shut down and to try to amplify them with our platform and just have really interesting conversations. So I'll start with Shalon Jodry, who is a narrative artist, an ecologist, a mother, a poet, a playwright, a podcaster, an oral storyteller, an actor, and a cultural interpreter. She lives with her family in the community of Olsitkuk. She is the author of the play script, as well as two poetry collections, Generations Remerging and Waking Ground. Waking Ground is currently shortlisted for the J.M. Abraham Poetry Award and the Maxine Tynes Nova Scotia Poetry Award. It was also listed by our reviewer, Anik McCaskill, as one of 2020's must-have poetry books. And I'm honored to introduce Shalon to you today. And I'll also introduce, at the same time, Rebecca Thomas. Rebecca is an award-winning Mi'kmaq poet. She was Halifax's Poet Laureate from 2016 to 2018. And she coordinated the Halifax Slam Poetry Team from 2014 to 2017 with the Canadian Festival of Spoken Word. In 2019, she published her first book, I'm Finding My Talk, which was named the CBC and Global Mail Best Book. She had a big year last year as well. She released her first full-length poetry book, I Place You Into the Fire, and her critically acclaimed children's book, Swift Fox All Along, was published last fall, and the uh, reviewer, Lisa Doucette, is one of 2020's must-have children's books. So I'm pleased to introduce them both to you, and I'll let the two of you take it over from there. Nice to meet you again, Rebecca. <laughs> yes, even if it's through a tiny box on my computer. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I know, I just have all these things. I was thinking the last few days of, you know, what I'd really love to talk to another Mi'kmaq poet about, and... Mm -hmm. uh, um, your your relationship to the print word and to poetry is, you know, is similar and different than my relationship to the print word and poetry, because um, I remember you as a spoken word poet, and seeing you on stage and seeing your videos. So for you, it was oral. For me, my orality was as a storyteller, but my poetry was print. Yeah. So how did you, how did you, I was just curious to talk to you, like, how did you come about poetry? How did you decide you wanted to get into it? Well, for me, it was, uh, it started off as like a, a professional development, creative project submission. I was having a conversation with one of my former colleagues, uh, Gail Wilson, and she was talking about some of the similarities between like the Mi'kmaq and Black communities in Nova Scotia, like similar histories, right? Whether it be environmental racism or residential school and a home for colored children. And then she put me on to Elle Jones and she said, have you ever seen Elle Jones's work? Um, who was the previous poet laureate and before me. And I said, no, I hadn't. And so I went and I looked at some of her, her videos and, and the stuff that I could find. And I thought, hmm, I wonder if I could do that. It was the first time that I'd really seen a form of art and been like, I, I want to do this. This is something I want to do. I think I could see, especially like visual artists or performance artists, right? When I think of like um, Pauline Young or Ursula Johnson, like I see like those forms of art and I'm deeply moved by them, but I, I don't think that I could do that. Well, one, I'm not a good drawer. Like I'm, my sister has all that talent that is not me. So I don't think that I would be very successful in that role. And then like the way Ursula's brain works in like this kind of these big performance pieces it's something that again, like I deeply admire, but I don't know if I'd have the capacity to do that. So the first time I saw that written piece and that performance piece in that way, I was like, this is, this speaks to me. I think I could do this and I think I could do it well. Um, and so I submitted that and then I wrote the next poem and the next poem and the next poem. And I went to my first open mic and it was received well. And then the rest is history, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice. Well, for me, my, my mother wrote, well, yeah, kind of writing at home. It took me a while to realize, you know, my father is an oral storyteller. Like he used to be in the military and he has these funny stories about being a, when he was a boy and he just knows how to tell a good story. And I wasn't really thinking about it that way for so many years. 
<clears throat> but it's my mother who is who would create story and write and, and talk about story. And I just loved reading when I was a kid. And somehow I think it started in school for me that we had to write a poem or something. <clears throat> and I thought, oh, this is neat. This is a neat art form. And like you, I, I mean, I do like to, I did at that point like to sketch. I wasn't good at it. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> think of myself as um like very visual like I have a hard time even decorating my house you know <laughs> I'm out in my studio but you know you know just plain plain wall we'll just decorate it with the wood <laughs> but um it's hard for me to visualize but I can hear I'm constantly hearing in words and and imagining stories and things that I want to write and so I started writing really shyly I'm naturally an introvert and uh, I would just sit outside at recess and be writing my little notebook or dreaming up stories and and so I started write, writing poetry as a kid like writing poetry so not not spoken mm -hmm. and uh, yeah I didn't really start sharing poetry spoken until it was um, until it was printed and edited a few times that I felt like I could, you know, share it and just read it, you know, as scared as I was. So um, I remember watching slam poets and like just amazing, like the energy that comes like not, not necessarily about the performance of it, but you know, that that passion that you have something to say, right. And I mean, some of my poems still still today, it's not so much that I feel like I have this thing to say. Sometimes it's very very quiet it's like this memory about being on the land or something it's just very you know very very gentle I have this um you know these poems that, that can be very gentle so it's just so amazing to watch people like you and Al that you have something to say and you have a rhythm and you're rhyming and you're making all these connections and um you know and just putting that that out in the world so it's been really uh, great to to watch you guys and just know that we all um we all all have different you know different art forms and uh yeah so it's been really great then to read uh your book even though i know he has you know you as a spoken word mm -hmm. artist it's great to be able to have those words so what what made you decide to print it publish it um well somebody approached me and said we'd like to publish your work um and so i said sure uh, because I thought about accessibility wise, I speak very quickly, you know, and I sometimes use like multisyllabic words because I like the way that I can internally rhyme them with other things. But if English isn't your first language, if you are a visual learner, um, if I go too fast for you to hear, um, or if you like to sit with words for a period of time, then the way that I perform is not going to be conducive to learning. And so that was going to be a question I asked you, is that so much of what I did for a very long time with my poetry was not because I wanted to be a poet, but rather I, I had a goal, a goal in mind for um, to kind of create a connection for like non-Indigenous people to see the humanity in us. Um, but also for Indigenous people to feel like righteously represented. Um, because it wasn't, and if, if, you know, if running marathons did that, I would do that. If, you know, if baking cupcakes achieved that goal, I would do that too. So it was never about necessarily becoming a writer. And so I'm curious as to like, what were your motivations for you for, for writing? Because I'm starting to write this kind of gentle, soft poetry. I wrote about the shape of my mom's hands because she's very sick and I don't see her. And uh, so I don't have that connection. But when I look at my hands, I, my hands look like my mom's hands. And so like I'm carrying her forward in my hands. And so like focusing on like the really micro stuff. And that makes me far more nervous to share publicly than me standing up and being like, oh, the Indian act. Oh, I was robbed of my language. Oh, like that I feel fine doing. But talking about my emotional connection to my family or my um, or the challenges that I have emotionally connecting with my family because of what has happened in history. Um, I find that to be far more scary <laughs> to even, even to write about it, to acknowledge that those feelings are there. So I guess what was your motivation for kind of writing that gentle, that gentle poetry and then wanting to share that? 
Yeah, I um, yeah, because I was kind of the um, <laughs> the other the other pieces, the pieces that I was from the other side. It's like, how are you brave enough to like stand up with that kind of um, conviction? But I mean, I under I understand it, but um, for for me, what motivated me to start writing was because I heard words and that was just my art. I don't remember, I don't know what it's like to not hear words and to hear story and to hear poetry because I feel like it's been my whole life. It was never a decision. It just, so for example, if, I, if I'm walking with friends or family on a trail and we're hiking and um, you know, maybe there's a little chitter chatter and then maybe it's just quiet for a while. As I'm walking, and one of the reasons I don't like to be first on a trail is so that I can just, I don't have to focus on where we're going. I can just follow the person in front of me. And I just daydream about stories or how I would put this together to describe it. And so when I have a beautiful experience, so there was this moment that I had my daughter smudging at the mouth of the Bear River the Olsid cook. And it just made me just hold, hold this memory in this experience in this conversation that she and I had about her ancestors, which are my ancestors, plus her Francophone father's ancestors. And, um, and I was thinking about these things and I just felt like I wanted to do something with it. And that thing was going to be a poem. So what are the words that I can craft? What is my paintbrush of words, you know, that I can see what I can do to try to replicate a sensation for people that they could, you know, it's kind of like that's my canvas with words either in here or on a page. So sometimes that inspiration, you know, even through my whole life of why a certain poem or story or to write in general um, is just because I, um, uh, it was something that moved me and I, and I needed to do something with it. And I think that's what happens as artists. So you use the tools that you were gifted, you know, that are in your medicine pouch. And, uh, and so for me, I guess it's not being a watercolor painter or a sculptor, <laughs> uh, sometimes musician, singer, songwriter, but that's not always my first go-to place. And, um, and so there's also some poems that I wrote and I could see it in your book too for you is that um, there's some poems that we, that we struggle with something personally. And I feel like, again, it's like this feeling that is bubbling up. And then I think, well, how can I, just, how can I figure this thing out? How can I figure why it bothers me, this moment or this situation? And so it might be something like I wrote this three-part poem about insomnia that I had and so it was just this thing in my life and it's like okay let me like actually take a look at it so for me my my way is writing so it's like okay if I can turn this thing into something as I'm carving it and trying to trying to put it outside of myself and take a look at it and paint it with words to be able to describe to somebody you know how does that make you feel or does this look like this does this look like how I actually felt as I work with it, it's, um, I mean, that's medicine for me as I work with the story or yeah. the poem. And I think why it's medicine for me is, is because that's just part of, um, you know, part of what was given to me as my tools, you know, that we all are drawn to different, different forms. I think just kind of looking through my book as my first book of poetry, that this is the this includes like the first poem, one of the first poems I've ever written, and then like some of the most recent poems that I've ever written. So you have that growth as like beginner writer to feeling a well-established writer, as well as the growth as, of me as like a woman and as a Nigama person to go from like a lot of insecurity, because um, I'm trying to figure stuff out, a lot of anger, you know, feeling that a lot of things were taken from me um, to like a, a quiet confidence. So any poetry that I put out after that won't have that same depth or growth because even though my writing styles may change or my content, me as a person is feeling more whole. And so I think what makes this poetry book really interesting is that you see that kind of growth, both as, an, as a writer and as a, as a human being. And I think that that 
um, is both something special to me, but also something that I, I sometimes feel a little like um, that somebody's reading my, you know, 18 year old self's diary. <laughs> you know what you mean? My first book had a couple of those. Yeah. Yeah. Like older, older poems. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad that they're in there um, because I think that there are people who relate to things. Like I have a poem in there that I don't, it's like, it's a, it's about like love. And um, I feel embarrassed when I read it. And I remember when I was getting editing notes back from my editor, I just highlighted them all. And I said, you know, right clicked, accept track changes. And I just moved on. <laughs> but then I would have people say that this poem was the most important one to them or they related to it the most. So I have to kind of remember that when I'm being a messy human being and not just a fully formed, put together articulate human being that the other people who are going through messy parts of their lives will relate to that content. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's part of what, why that's in there. Mm -hmm. Right. There's actually two poems from my first book that I pulled last minute and I said, I don't think I'm ready for that out. And then I put them in my second book. So did how did you, you feel? <laughs> How did you feel about that? Like, I'm curious. Yeah, like I, I pulled them. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. So they were, they were personal and they were just a little bit more personal than I thought I was ready for. So just like going back to your other question about, you know, these personal, very vulnerable poems. <clears throat> and so it gave me some time uh to do two things one was to edit it again come back to it a few years later so okay how can i actually how can i edit this in a way that still carries the same thoughts and and storyline but maybe just soften just a couple of edges or or um uh like fuzz them out you know like just blur them a little bit so they're not too specific and, and one was because I needed to talk to my father first. Mm -hmm. So I was curious um, because it was about like the transgenerational trauma. Mm -hmm. And so I was curious, did you end up talking to your father before you published the poems about him? It was interesting. My dad has been a big champion of my work. Um, and it, from my first YouTube videos, he would go, and he would, anybody who would listen, go, this is my daughter, this is my daughter. Um, and there was one time I remember he was down visiting. Um, it was for Christmas, I think in 2017, maybe. And he was here in Halifax and it was his first time spending Christmas like in my home, in my house here. Uh, and we were out for a drive and we were coming back from something. I think my dad went to like an AA meeting and then we went to go get lunch. And as we were driving, he was very like, he's like, you know what? He's like, he goes, I just want to make sure that you know that you can say whatever you want about me. Wow. <laughs> and he goes, and if you're hurt because of what I did, lay it on me, right? Uh, and so he was always mm -hmm. very transparent, and very supportive of that, um, which was really like nice to hear that, he, you know, he, he he's not good at communicating a lot of times. And even that, right, like right now we're trying to work with him on some things and it's just, it's, you know, I'm pulling my hair out cause I'm getting so frustrated sometimes, but he's always been really good about like, he's like, I know I wasn't a perfect man and I know I caused harm and you have a right to talk about that if it helps you. And so he was always very good about that, um, which was always really nice to know that he's so open to that, to those conversations because as much grief and as much, you know, strife as he was, you know, that caused me as a kid and as a you know, adolescent and a young woman, you know, I recognize that where that came from, you know, he's got trauma of residential school, he's got trauma of war. And, and so there's a, there's a whole bunch of like love and support at the same time as me processing stuff, you know, when I was a kid. And so those are very like messily twined together. And it's interesting that like those kinds of relationships I feel comfortable talking about. But I wrote a poem recently about platonic love, just how much I love my friends and how we don't talk about how much we love our friends, right? It's like the word love is reserved for your parents and your spouse, you know, <laughs> and, and maybe your kids if you have them. 
And so like, I wrote this poem about platonic love and I was like, well, I can never show anybody this because I am mortified that it exists. <laughs> and I think that's indicative of like that intergenerational trauma of being able to share those feelings and those, you know, being vulnerable and talking about love in that way. And so I will probably put it in a book somewhere, but I don't know when and if I will be fully ready, you know, to talk about that sort of stuff because I'm still very uncomfortable about it. I have friends who give me a hug and they say, I love you. And I, I stiffen up and like, I feel those words. I feel that, yeah. sen that, that sentiment, <laughs> but I, yeah. I can't, I can't say it. I can't, I'll be like, okay, you do. <laughs> like I have to escape. <laughs> and so it's, it's something that takes, I think, you know, writing about it is, is my safe space to kind of process. Yes, know, exactly. Things. Exactly. Well, yeah. Yeah, so if you do put it in your second book, it gives you some time to go back to it and kind of bring up that and your, you know, that energy and that trust to to put it in. But um, yeah, I sometimes I, I get a little bit worried about, you know, when I go do a poetry reading, if it's in a class or a group or event or whatever, about the questions when it's the QA after, or that if people will ask me about specific poems because they did in my first book, I haven't really toward my second book in the pandemic uh, but we do get q a a little bit um, through virtual but it seems more like general general questions i don't really get questions on zoom about well in this poem you know were you talking about this or how did this come about but i did get those questions in my first book so i was just nervous about people asking me about some of the poems because although i published it i don't really want there's still a couple things I don't really want to talk about publicly, even though I've published them. <laughs> yeah, I understand that for sure. Um, and I and I have gotten questions where I'm like, I don't want to answer that. Or I don't feel like answering that. Or, you know, what do you think it means? And I'll put the question back onto them. Um, and I do, I understand that because I think, like we can write poetry for an audience, but it doesn't give that audience 100% access to us because those po those those poems are, are linked to our our lives our personal experiences our emotions are, and so you know i'm giving you a glimpse of it but you don't have the the rights to it and i think that sometimes because something is published or made public that that understanding isn't always clear mm -hmm. and so i do come up with people come up against people who kind of get a little bristled when i say like no that's i'm i'm granting you access to a little bit of me but you don't get to have all of me Mm -hmm. um, all right. find, I'm going to use that line. Thank you. Yeah. And so I'm curious, like about like that kind of piece, like as an artist, like the nature of, of, of poetry is, is, is bound with emotion. And so like, I guess, how do you toe that line sometimes of like wanting to write and share, but at the same time, wondering if this is shareable, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I, and I think that once we start sharing, then we think that everything we create should be shared, right? Like, well, mm -hmm. if I write a poem tomorrow, well, that has to be in my next collection, right? Because that's why we write now, because we put this out into the world. That's our, you know, that's our role in society is to be, uh, to, to be writers and to share our art. And so it is, <laughs> I do have to think about that every so often well it is possible that I would write things that I actually don't share maybe there is a poem that I wrote just for my father or a poem that I wrote just for you know a friend or family member that yeah that that wasn't that didn't go in any book or didn't go in any anthology it was this private art you know it was this art piece one of a kind for them and I just left it there so I just have to remind myself that not everything I create has to be for the world. It could actually be just for somebody around me, but um, but I I I want to. It gets exciting to you know to think you know what else can I share with people, um, because we see what um, what great conversation it brings about, and that's a good feeling. A feeling like okay, this is part of why I'm doing this is to instigate good conversation. And that's also a lot of responsibility once you realize it and how you can do that, then it's it's also this feeling of, all right, I am this artist for the community. This is the thing that, you know, that people are asking of me, you know, when um, I don't know if, 
people came to you and asked you to write about the corn man? Sorry, I called him the corn man in my in my book of poetry. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but um, I don't know if people, if the city had asked that of you or other people had asked that of you, or if you said, no, this is what I have, yeah, what I have to write. Yeah, it was, it was what I have to write. Um, mm -hmm. I have had, well, I'll, t I'll touch on like people asking in a minute, but with regards to that poem, um, part of the Poet Laureate duties is to deliver poetry's and count, poetry and counsel in April for National Poetry Month. Um, but, and I had this other poem, it's called, um, oh, I forget what, I wish I was better at writing love poems. That was the poem that I was going to do. And it was about myself. It was, it was a poem of like, I, if, you know, if I were better at writing love poems, I would tell myself all of these things, right? Um, to learn to, to love yourself. And then as we were like walking into city council, I said to Jamie McClellan, who runs the poetry kind of the, the sorry, the Polari program, as well as his boss, Elizabeth Taylor. And I said, that's not the poem I'm doing, I'm doing this poem. <laughs> and, and then I went, because I felt really compelled. It felt like a great sense of responsibility. Um, here I am as a Mi'kmaq poet and access to a room full of decision makers that affect people in our community. And it was an, a duty and an obligation in order to represent you know something like that in that moment now I don't think it's fair when you know indigenous poets are put in positions automatically and expectantly by non-indigenous community people to think that they can speak on behalf of a community but in that moment I had access to something that not a lot of my community had so there it's it's different right it's people when people approach me and say can you speak on behalf of this I say no because I'm only one person um, but when put into a role where I could advocate for my community that's when I felt like a responsibility but I have had people request poems or send me like lots and lots of people who will send me uh, direct messages all over social media they'll send me emails some folks have gotten hold of my phone number whether it's my work phone number or my personal phone number to call me um, and then a lot of community members going through a lot of deep pain will have um, kind of talked about their, their experiences with trauma um, and ask, and will ask me like, you need to write a poem about this. And so it can be a little daunting because part of me is like, I just want to do poetry for myself. Like, I just want to write about the shape of my mom's hands, you know? But then the other side of me is like, I'm really good at this and I can change people's minds. And so maybe I should write about all of these things that people are asking me for. Mm -hmm. And I find that can sometimes set me up for like a bit of a like spiral of, I should, I should, I should, I should. Um, and, and that can be sometimes a tough, tough line to, to, to walk. But I've gotten better at it, uh, at, at figuring out like what I can and cannot handle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to make sure that you have a little bit of both, right? To make sure that you have mm -hmm. some that are, yeah, just about the shape of trees, just about the shape of your mom's hands, you know, that we need yeah. those ones too. And for me, one of the reasons that I liked some of these um, little ones, I have this poem that's just about drinking tea in February. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> really, it was this moment of drinking tea. And, uh, and so I made this poem. And, uh, but it, sometimes I think that sometimes we need those little, those little nuggets of um, just, it's kind of like looking at a landscape picture that somebody painted or took a photo of, it's just other types of medicine, you know, and so I think about it that way that it might not all of them might not be um, here, here's a story I want to tell, but here's just like this, this image of something calm or something medicine-like or something um, funny or <laughs> like, like the corn man one. It's probably one of my shorter poems. But I do, I find myself gravitating towards those kinds of poems um, from personally, because I think I, I seek out that calmness or I seek out those like very simple pleasures. Um, but when I write, I sometimes feel it as like, all right, I'm on a mission. Yeah. It's work time, yeah. right? So I seek out <laughs> the sorts of poems to kind of find calmness, which I really enjoy. Which so what are you working on now? Well, I am writing a couple different things, but one is um, I'm trying to write a book about fire. Ooh. Actually, based on my on my master's, 
um, it was researching, talking to elders about fire. So I'm trying to write about that. Um, I only write poems when something comes up. Like I don't sit down and say, okay, I'm, I'm going to write a book of poetry now. I don't know how that would go for me, but, um, but I just write a poem when it comes and I just kind of like start collecting them. But, um, but yeah, I, it's COVID is starting to get tougher in Nova Scotia. Hey, like it's, yeah. um, I know that we were so lucky through the whole year. We kept telling everybody and ourselves that in Nova Scotia, but I just feel like we've been trying to be so good for a year. And part of me is just getting tired, tired of trying to be, you know, what all these measures mean. And so I can't promise that I'll be able to write over the next few months that I'll have the energy yeah. to, but, um, what about you? I mean, I juggle things like like you do. So yeah, I have ideas. Um, I pitched another kid's book to my publisher, and they really liked the idea. Nice. The idea is like just centered around my grandfather's chair and how much of my life and our relationship. I was very very close with my grandfather, um, and he died when I was nineteen. And so it's kind of like focusing. The way that I can explain is, did you ever see the Disney or the Pixar movie Up? Yes, I did. You know that first bit where it's just oh, like this life, yeah. this life in, yeah. in like just there's no speaking. It's just this like this beautiful, beautiful but sad life. And it's just focused around the, the, the life and like the comfort and the love and the sadness and the loss that happened around this, this chair. Um, you know, that it's about the chair and like what we're going through is like the, what's surrounding that chair. And so I pitched that idea and she, my publisher really liked it as a way to kind of talk about growing up and um, like kind of hard stuff with like kids, right? Because just because your kid doesn't necessarily mean that you're not gonna experience like loss or love and, and like, you know, those sorts of comfort, comforting feelings and those very sad feelings. So it's kind of, that's one of the things. So she liked the idea and now, it's about, you know, building the story that goes with it. And then this other thing, I have this idea and it's been in the back of my brain for a little while and I don't know how to do it because it's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a novel and I've never written anything like that before. Mm -hmm. But I really like to read like romantic comedy novels for my escapism, mm -hmm. but they're always uh, usually between white people and never between indigenous people. And so I want to write a romantic comedy novel between indigenous people and on reserve, off reserve love story yeah. and like the comedy and like the seriousness and like weave in some of that, like that stuff that's like we joke about, you know, like weave in kind of like that native sense of humor, but also some of the really serious things like, you know, identity politics, like who's more, who is and who is not considered more indigenous. And like, so weave that into this love story. Um, between on reserve and off reserve. I don't know how to do it. I think what I'm gonna do is just Andre Fenton who has written um, like Annika and Worthy of Love, a uh, good friend of mine. Um, I asked him, I was like, how do you write? How do you write a novel? How do you write like a story, a cohesive story over 300 pages? Yeah. Uh, and so he said, he's like, first try just making chapters and like a, a, a theme of each chapter, like a title story, like a, you know, three, three sentence blurby of each chapter and it's like and then expand those chapters so mm -hmm. it was really helpful so I have to figure out how to do that but like you I'm very tired I am mm -hmm. feeling pandemic drain and that's us having lived a somewhat normal life here in Nova mm -hmm. Scotia let alone individuals who like in Ontario have been on lockdown for a year you know mm -hmm. so gentle Ideas are still going, writing down ideas, but feeling no pressure to bring those ideas to fruition yeah. yet. Well, thanks yeah. for thanks for the chat. Yeah, it was really nice. Yeah. Thank you, Wallen. <laughs> <laughs>